And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You may sit. Thank you, Steve, for reading. Appreciate that. Uh, my name is Chris Pluckenpole, and welcome to Wells Branch Community Church. I'm the lead pastor. It's so grateful uh, that all of you are here. And one of the things I love to do is I love questions. There is no questions that are out of bounds. We talk faith, culture, everything in between. We drop a new podcast usually every Tuesday. We'd love to interact with you uh, with God's Word. So um, I won't think you're resetting your fantasy football team because your starters got hurt. Uh, I know that you're texting me with the number on the screen, and so would love to interact with you. Now, we've been in a series called uh, The Gospel of Mark. We've been doing it uh, from the summer, and the intent is to take Mark all the way to Easter with a couple with Advent and a couple other relationship stuff in between, and um, I am pumped about it. And um, one of the things that I think is always hard to talk about, just because people in general don't like talking about this particular subject, is suffering, right? Suffering in Christianity we don't like to talk about it because then it gets you questioning all sorts of things. Um, about a year and change ago, I was playing soccer in the backyard with my son, Austin. And we play barefoot all the time because that's how we roll. And, uh, you know, there's lots of, you know, things in the yard like metal. And he, like, stepped on, like, you know, those little spiky things that you hold the thing that keeps your yard separated, grass from, like, mulch things. You know, you know what I'm talking about? A little, so he stepped right on that and like, ching And I was like, ah! And we, you know, it didn't even hurt me, but it looked like it hurt, so I did that. Uh, and so then I'm like, all right, let's go to the emergency room. Although there was a lot of thought about duct tape at the time, not going to lie. Uh, and then we're like, nah, this is definitely not going to heal on its own. So we went to um, the, the ER, and he got sewed up. But before he could get sewed up, they had to take lidocaine, and they have to on the bottom of the foot, kind of a sensitive area, apparently. And so, and so it's like, all right, Austin, uh, the doctor is going to give you a, a shot. It's going to you feel a little bit of a sting. <laughs> no! You know, it's like, uh, don't worry, only 10 more to go. You know, and, uh, and so we want, it was so painful. In the moment, I was like, this is hurting me more than it's hurting you. He's like, no, it's not. You know? <laughs> and, the, you know, putting your kid through any sort of suffering is very difficult, Okay. And there has to be a purpose in it, or you wouldn't willingly do it. And um, one, of the, one of the sort of the objections to Christianity that I, I've read about is uh, like a guy named Steve Chalk, a theologian, also a heretic, but a person that doesn't believe in Jesus says, like, here's the problem I have with you and you Christians. It's cosmic child abuse. So if, if God, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-perfect one, sends his perfectly righteous son to a cross, then that's tantamount to child abuse. How can you Christians be okay with that? And if there is no purpose in the cross, if the, pur if the purpose of the cross is just for suffering, then he might be right. But there's way more purpose than that. And I think somebody like uh, Steve or pretty, a, lot of, a lot of people, I think their preference is karma. We want people to get what they deserve. And if a perfectly righteous person, they need to get perfectly righteous treatment. And you would say, I'm not that bad. I shouldn't get this much bad things. <laughs> we all do that. We all kind of speak in terms of karma. We speak, a, our language of our culture is karma, if we're just honest. In fact, we, and that's primarily because we live in this world where the cross isn't central. But when the cross is central, um, we, we resist it. We resist the cross being central because, well, we believe that we get what we, what we deserve. Good things and bad things. So when we look at Jesus, we go, the cross, that's cosmic child abuse. He should be uh, championed and glorified, even if it is some crazy myth. You should not put that in to that sort of mindset. Or the flip side of that, we resist the suffering of the cross when we believe that we deserve good things from God. We deserve that when we trust in Jesus, he paid it all on the cross, so I should be experiencing the American dream. 
Okay? Or, finally, resist to suffer the cross when we believe we don't deserve anything. And you've, you may have said this without knowing you were um, sort of propitiating a, uh, a theology of nihilism, really is what this is. Because well, you said, I don't deserve anything good, or I don't deserve anything bad, I don't, don't, don't worry about me. What you're saying is like, nothing really matters. What I did doesn't even matter. What you do doesn't matter. Nothing matters. And that's a nihilistic worldview. In fact, all these are different worldviews. We just don't know. Here's karma. Here's the prosperity gospel. And here is nihilism. And so we're going to get into all uh, three of those as we walk through the gospel of Mark. And I'll define those for you because I know that uh, those are just words of, of a different philosophical thought. And you probably didn't even know that you believed any of these things. And so here we go. We're going we're to train us on being good thinkers uh, because I think that's important for you to endure any sort of suffering that you might encounter. Okay. So we're going to pray. If you have a Bible, would you find one somewhere? We're going to be on page 843 to start. And uh, I would love uh, for you, actually 844 to start. And I would love for us to get into his word. And if you don't have a copy of God's word, this is our gift to you. Um, let's pray and ask God to, to bless the reading and proclamation of his word. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you are in complete control. And we thank you that you do miracles, and we've seen it. We thank you that you call us to do hard things, and we have been through hard things. And so, God, I pray that you would bless this reading, you bless the hearers, and that your Holy Spirit would just be working in the minds and hearts of everyone here. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. All right, here we go. So first off, whenever I, we've, you've been in a mark with me for a while, and I like to share with you all the fun structural hamburgers that we have in here, and there is another structural hamburger for you to partake of, all right? For if you're a theologian person, this is called a chiastic uh, structure, which I'm, I know that you, for many of you, like, don't care about the word, so I won't explain it. But for the rest of you, here it is. There's buns, right? The buns is, is going to come the very first, the very end part. Jesus must suffer, all right? Jesus must suffer but is pointing to an actual other thing, which seems like the whole thing is about Jesus suffering on the cross, which it is, until you look at the center and you find that Jesus calls the disciples to lay down their lives for Jesus' sake. And so that's going to be the calling. That's what, that's what Steve read for us. And that is really where our hearts are. And again, there's a resistance part. I, I was in this. I came because my life was in crisis and I was brought to comfort. And Jesus calls those in comfort out of the comfy chair and into a life of discipleship. Okay, that's where we're going with that. Uh, we're going to start here now in uh, Mark chapter uh, 8, verse 27. And here we go. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. So way northwest part of Israel. Uh, this is also where the gates of hell were. It was like a religious place where you go and worship and and do pagan ritual. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? What's the latest word on the street? What's the social media vibe? What's, what have you seen trending uh, in media? And they go, well, uh, some say you're John the Baptist. And if we're honest, John the Baptist is who, or that Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist. Uh, Herod thought that uh, he had been raised from the dead because he felt guilty about killing him, right? And others said he's Elijah. Now, Elijah did lots of awesome miracles. And so Old Testament-wise, when you saw Jesus do a miracle, you, the only guy that did lots of miracles in the Old Testament, you'd be like, he Elijah, that guy did miracles. And others, one of the prophets, okay? So you're just a really prophetic guy, good dude. You get good dude awards. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And this is the pinnacle question. This is the question that when you answer it, it says everything there is to know about you. And when you go, Jesus is a good guy. Jesus is a crazy person. Jesus is just a legend. That's really nice. And so everything I'm talking about is just legendary information. And it's a really sweet story that you people believe. And you, you need the emotional crutch. Who do you say that I am? And he's going to ask that. And, and Peter answers, and he nails this one. There's going to be plenty of times where Peter doesn't nail it, but he nails it here. You are the Christ. Now, when he says you are the Christ, he's saying Christ means anointed one or Messiah. And if any one of your friends, you're like, hey, who do you think, you know, what's the word on the street about me? You know, you're, you're in the dating world. You're like, what do, what do the girls think about me? And if someone said, you're the Messiah, 
well, you, you're in good stead there on the dating world, but that probably means that the person is codependent on you, right? This would be bad news. If you've got a friend who calls you their Messiah, bad. If you have a spouse that you think is the Messiah, you've only been married for about a month. And so what happens is that all of you know that this is bad news to have somebody who thinks you're the Messiah as a friend. It's going to go badly. I promise. All right. So here's, he strictly charged them to tell no one about him, about the fact that he's the Messiah, which to some of you are like, well, of course, because that's crazy. Well, hold on. And then he began to teach them about what that meant. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man, the Messiah, must suffer many things. And at first you can go like, oh yeah, there's, there's like this, you're suffering, because the word for suffering is passion, right? Passion. That's why the passion of the Christ, it's suffering. You are like suffer with love for people, I get that. And he's like, no, not that kind of suffering. And he must be rejected. Like, you know, middle school, lunch table, you're not welcome. That kind of rejection by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Okay, it's not just rejection. It's they are going to kill him. To which when you hear all that and you're Peter and you just like, you know, subscribe to your allegiance, that's the Messiah, that would make you feel pretty weird. Like Messiahs don't usually die. They usually deliver everybody else. And then after three days, rise again. To which if you would have started off with like, hey guys, I'm going to rise again, but just, bad, you know, good news first, because uh, after you've been told three bad things, it's hard to recover on the good thing. And I don't think Peter even heard this part. After three days, rise again. Because Peter jumps in, and he's speaking this super plainly. And Peter took him aside. And you got it. <laughs> That's why I love this. And Peter take, and like, puts his arm around him, like, Jesus. Takes him aside and began to rebuke him. And I bet it went something like this. Listen, I know we've had a hard day. Like, we just fed 4,000. It wasn't 5,000. The numbers aren't, we're starting to go down in numbers. But listen, there's market fluctuations. More people are going to come next time. You just got to do a little more, you know, wheeling and dealing and some bread and loaves, fishes. We've got this thing. We don't need to talk down. And here's Jesus. This is where he's, you know, he's taking all in. And and Peter is, he's like, you're scaring the children. I can handle you talking like that. I get that you get down. These guys aren't there. Like, this is, you know, leadership 101. We show, gripes go up. They don't go down. All right, he's kind of, he's schooling Jesus. And Jesus turning, seeing his disciples, because they're all like, go get him. He rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Just one of the most classic lines. Satan, if you didn't know, it just means enemy. I mean, not only does it mean like the devil, but it means, the, the word means the adversary, the enemy. Get behind me. You're my enemy. And for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Because here's, here's Peter. He's listen, Jesus, you've been really good. You deserve good things. You deserve this. You, a lot of goods come to you because you've been really good. You're a good boy. Santa's going to reward you. Don't talk bad about this experience. Good things happen to good people because we all know you get what you deserve. Thank you, Peter, for your karma lesson. But the good news of the the gospel is that the suffering of the cross overcomes karma. And and karma just means the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of of existence. That's going to decide your future fate. And the universe, the non-personal force of the universe sort of decides this, which I'm not sure how it decides if it's impersonal, but whatever. Uh, and, but if you do well in this life, you're going to get a next, better next life. If you do bad in this life, the next one's going to be extra cruddy. So do good. You don't want it to get worse. And so that's like a fear-based way of living. That's karma. And, you know, you go like, hmm. You know, everyone, like all the cartoons, like all the characters, like they reach a point of bliss and they're kind of doing some karma moments. And the reality, what they're saying is like, I've achieved nothingness. I, I've achieved a, a state of bliss. I don't need anything. But the reality is it's all based on performance. And if we were real about our performance, we would see that we were very much lacking. Let me explain how grace works because I think this is confusing. Um, all right, so many of you have like jobs, and then you have, so you have people you have, are responsible to at your workplace, and then you have people you're responsible to at your home place, and there's always gonna be an intersection there. And people are gonna get angry when you don't give your time in the right spot. Can I get an amen? 
Okay. So it goes like this. Uh, this week, uh, I had a meeting. It was at 4.30. I was like, ah, oh, it's going to be a quick one. I'll be out of there by 15 minutes tops. No problem. The home by 5. No, no issue. Well, uh, the meeting starts, and it, we're like 15, 20 minutes in, 30 minutes in. I'm like, Melanie, I need you to talk to Adrian. You know, I kind of, you know, one of those nods. And then we keep going with the meeting. And then finally, it's 6 o'clock, and I get home, and I'm like, oh, man. I, I'm an hour. This is like bad. I am way late. I'm going to walk in, and she's going to let me have it, and I, I deserve it. You know, like. And so, and what she did was she's like, hey, listen, uh, I got dinner made. Uh, I've, I've got everything ready. I'm going to put the, I'll help you put the first kid down, and then um, I got to do a ladies' meeting, and so we'll, we'll just hand off. And I was like, wow, all right. You see, what I deserved was, Oh, well, 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 look who showed up at home today. Thanks for showing up to work. And then she's like, hey, uh, I couldn't make dinner because I had four kids that were, you know, just doing, like, body blows, and I was in the middle of breaking that up, so I didn't have time to interact with any sort of food. So figure it out. I'm out of here. She could have gone that route, but what Grace says is I absorb your cost at my expense. It's your benefit at my expense, and that's what Grace is. And that's not karma. Karma is, and this is how we sort of live our lives, especially uh, not our marriage, of course, but some marriages out there uh, live like this. Oh, you didn't come through for me? Fine, figure it out yourself. I'm not coming through for you. And then so we sort of, sp- we're like, oh yeah, well, you first. I'll, I'll start doing when you start doing. And we don't have a picture of grace anywhere modeled for us. And you haven't seen it because your parents got divorced. And it's just like this exhausting life of one-upsmanship. So no wonder our kids are on all sorts of medication. Their brains have been fried by all the stuff they've witnessed their parents back and forth, jockeying them all over the place. You guys know there's a shortage of Adderall in the country, around the world? Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, that reality has come to this place because we need help. All right. So the cross overcomes karma. Now, now, Jesus then takes this one teaching moment, and then he goes broader, okay, broader. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, let me break it down for you. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. No one thought, like, in that day, taking up his cross didn't mean like, all right, if you want more gains outside the gym, so you can flex and have everybody go, mm, you need to put more time in the gym. And so you got to work harder. The more hard work, the more you get out of it. That's, that's when we, I think that's our viewpoint of take up your cross. If you want to make more money, you got to put more effort in. You got to have a little sacrifice. That's not this kind of sacrifice. This is an American dream sacrifice. This is like you, someone else's benefit at your expense. And I think this is the struggle we have because we haven't been taught what grace is. We don't know what it looks like. We haven't seen it modeled. Let him deny himself. You don't get the gains. You give away the gains. You take up the cross. You follow Jesus. To which everyone's like, um, what else you got? <laughs> For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever will lose, lose his life for not just any sake, not to just be like uh, a sadist or a masochist who just loves to inflict pain on others or yourself. Like, no, look, for my sake and the gospels, the gospel is that Jesus came and he gave the benefit of heaven at his expense. He was broken and he died on a cross for our sins. And if you will give your life for that message, oh man, you're going to save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, which is sort of weird he would say that then, because it feels like back in the old days when, you know, people knew how to act, and... We would just go like, man, it was bad then. Oh, it's bad then. It's bad now. It's always bad because people are depraved. They, are dark, they have dark hearts from the get-go. Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in gl- the glory of his Father with the holy angels. In other words, the suffering of the cross overcomes the prosperity gospel. 
Okay. So the prosperity gospel is just some, if you guys aren't familiar with it, it's a religious belief among some Christian sects, if you will, that blessing and physical well-being are always the will of God for your life. So if you are a real Christian and you have faith, then you will have material blessing and healing and all the stuff. And whenever you see someone who is wealthy, that's a sign of divine favor. And when you say it out loud like that, it's like, no, 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 you wouldn't believe it. But what happens is when you get into a place where you're naming and claiming, listen, we saw a miracle happen here with a guy who was in a wheelchair. He ain't in a wheelchair. He's walking all over the place. And, and now you, you go, well, that must be God's will for everybody. No, it's not. In fact, someone is going to be called to take up their cross and stay in the wheelchair. That doesn't sell tickets. But it's true. And what can happen is when we see that, that Jesus has a specific plan to use your suffering, because all things work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So although the suffering may be hard, and although it may be challenging, and although you may ask, and you beg, and you plead with God, say, please! And he may say, no, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so then you say, I'll boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's the response of the gospel. That's how you overcome the prosperity gospel, which says it's always going to be awesome cupcakes and rainbows. No, it's going to be hard. Because Jesus said, come, deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Leave the comfort. Remember, everybody comes to Christ in a crisis, and then Christ gives them great comfort, whether it's physical or uh, material, whether it's emotional or spiritual, existential crisis. Everybody comes to Christ in a crisis, and then he moves you from there to this place of I'm going to go and follow Jesus, even if it means going to the cross. Okay. And, and I think, um, we, again, in our American Western world, we have a hard time with that. But listen, the, the gospel isn't just an American gospel. Uh, in fact, right now, and I was like, I look up Voice of the Martyrs. Voice of the Martyrs is just a, a place where different uh, people tell their story about persecution around the world. And you guys know that there's, Christianity is not legal everywhere. Christianity in some parts of the world is looked down upon. And I'm not talking about like people get irritated that you posted something on social media and put a thumbs down on it. No, what I'm talking about is that um, in India, August of 2022, August, like this year, two months ago, while hosting a prayer meeting, policemen banged on the door and began threatening everybody in attendance. And then they arrested the pastor. This is two months ago. And then in recalling the incident, after they, they beat him, tortured him, he said, I realized, that this, I realized our time of persecution had come. I'd always known that I was taking a risk. But he said, I read in the Bible that when Jesus sent out his disciples, he told them they were going out to be like sheep among wolves, although fearful of what might happen. Pastor Shakar continued to share about the Jesus he had found. And after being beaten, tortured, and threatened, he was somehow released. And then Pastor Shakar took his church underground to continue the work. That's happening now. This isn't like some crazy story in the Bible that, you know, Paul and Silas in stocks and then they had to cry out and earthquakes and things open. No, this is people suffering now. So the, if the prosperity gospel is true, and again, I, I know it feels like I'm just kicking prosperity gospel because it's an easy thing to kick because everyone's like, down with rich people. Um, <laughs> but that, that's, not, that's not it. It's just the reality of like Jesus has this specific uh, plan for us to come and follow him, lay down our lives for his glory. And that's happening around the world. The same Christ, the same Holy Spirit is interacting in India as it is here in Austin, Texas. And that's important for you to know as we are an international community. I mean, every, you know, what happens here changes the world because we're in Austin. Well, everybody's coming here. And so if we're not aware of what Christianity looks like globally, we're going to miss out on the goodness of how God is working. Because what happened in India two months ago or is happening currently it's going to affect people who will be your next door neighbor. And they're here. And so let's kind of have a mindset to understand that the way we, when we teach poorly or wrongly about Jesus, that gets sent out and people think, oh, wow, something must be wrong with my faith. It takes a mustard seed of faith, like a little bitty, bitty amount of faith to move a mountain. And if it doesn't move, it wasn't God's will for it to move. But I think that's the problem we have. We don't trust God enough to ask him 
and we don't trust God enough to tell us no. And so that's why we start maneuvering and working and manipulating. Keep moving. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Which, this is where some would say, look, there are some standing, like, this is like the disciples, that generation be standing there, they will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. To which, like, that's why revelation must have been fulfilled in their lifetime. To which I would say, no, because I read the next verse. And after six days, so six days, he's like, that conversation happens, there's six days that pass, and then Jesus took with him uh, some of them, Peter, James, and John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. To which you're like, transfigured? Like, what sort of, you know, transformer is he? Did he become like, you know, a, a car or what? No, he's, he's going to be transfigured like this, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And it was kind of like when you read the Old Testament of Moses coming down the mountain, just radiance glowing from him. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, to which this gets utterly bizarre, and they're talking with Jesus. And so Elijah and Moses, Elijah is the most popular prophet of the Old Testament, and Moses is the guy that wrote the law. So the law and the prophets are both testifying that Jesus is the Christ. That's what you're doing here on the Mount of Transfiguration. So then Peter said to Jesus, which I love this. This is Peter talking because he's thinking. Do, you, do I have any of those people here that like you don't talk or rather you don't think unless you're speaking? Does that make sense? Like your, your brain doesn't work without your mouth. Does it, anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. So here it is. Rabbi, it is good we are here. He's pontificating for us. Let us make three tents. One for you and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then I can just imagine him going on about, like, we can start charging tickets. This is going to, we'll, we'll have more than the 4,000. Listen, and this is just the reality. Is for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. I can imagine so. And he just says whatever. He's like, ah, uh, mouth starts running. You know, kind of like that awkward silence. You're not really sure what to say. And then the, that guy starts talking. Everyone's like, shh. Well, in this moment... A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. And this is glorious. In this moment, Peter just keeps talking, and God himself has to shut him up. <laughs> this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And I love this. Let me tell you how much I love this. Everybody in the building needs to hear this. Like, he's willing to shut up Peter to tell everybody how much he loves his son. And I love this because John 17 says, I, this is Jesus pray, I pray that you would love them even equal to is the way you've loved me. And so whenever you read, the God, the Father, whenever he's talking to Jesus, he's telling him he loves him. And if you're wondering as a dad what you should say to your kids, you just say this a lot over and over, I love you. I'm proud of you. You're mine. And here's his dad talking to his son. This is my beloved son, Peter. Shut up. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. So the law and the prophets, all that they said is fulfilled. And so now only Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. To which they're like, all right, let's not bring this up about the being dead thing, not a good thing. Let's figure out how we can talk about that without Jesus. So they kept the matter to themselves. Give them some space. Questioning what rising from the dead might mean. Here it is. And then they asked him, why did the scribes say that first uh, Elijah must come? So they're like trying to get to this whole rising from the dead. They go to Elijah, and Elijah shows up in Malachi that he's going to have to come before uh, the, the day of the Lord, to which they're thinking that's the kingdom of God. We're bringing the whole thing in. Let's get this thing going. And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things, to call people to repentance, to have a right view of God. And how is it written of the Son of Man? This is where Jesus continues. He's going to kind of take it back from like awkwardness to more awkwardness. How is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things, Peter, and be treated with contempt? And this is scriptural. This is Isaiah 52, Isaiah 53. The, the suffering servant, that he would come, and Jesus fulfills exactly that. And he says, but I tell you, 
Elijah has come in the form of John the Baptist. And they did to him whatever they please. And then this last part, as it is written of him. Well, what do, what do you mean, Jesus? All right, let me try to explain this part because this gets confusing. Because like, if Elijah has come, how was it written of him that they would do to him whatever he pleased? Well, 1 Kings 19, all right? This is when Elijah, he, uh, he calls down fire. Everyone's pretty pumped about a glorious day. 400 prophets of Baal die. And then Jezebel is furious, and she sets out a death threat that reaches the ears of Elijah. And he despairs of life. He's like, just kill me now, God. Like after this unbelievable mon monumentous task. And so what we see here is that uh, the queen, infuriated by the words of a prophet, sought to kill him, okay? John the Baptist, come, came the spirit of Elijah. He calls out the king. Yeah, he is like brutally honest. He's like, you are in sin. You're married to the wrong woman. I mean, like, if you want to talk about public square, like, call, like this is old school. Like, everyone there is probably like, oh, gosh, let, you know, that's not exactly the way to win him over. But he doesn't care. He's like, this is wrong. And Herodias makes her not happy. And so she sends her daughter in to um, perform a dance for him that you might be seeing at Perfect Ten. And the next thing you know, she's working it. And he's like, you know what? You're right. Anything you want, ma'am, go for it. And then what happens? John the Baptist loses his head. Oh, for what and for what? And you might look at that and go like, why would you do that? Come on, God, what are you doing? John the Baptist is not a bad guy. John the Baptist is calling out for righteousness. He's doing the right thing. And why is he suffering? Unless there's a greater purpose, unless there's something much bigger, then that is meaningless. I mean, I feel like this is where... Why didn't he go down in a blaze of glory? He should have been out preaching, but he just gets you know, quietly, they chop off his head and bring it, you know, and they kill him. He was dinner party sport. And I feel like this is where we, we come into interaction, like there is nothing right, there's nothing wrong. This is a German philosopher, Frederick Nietzsche, kind of going like, listen, God is dead. And he kind of brings us, listen, we're all facing into the despair of nihilism, which is, there is no objective order or structure in the world except that which we give it. To which Nietzsche was like, listen, there's no point. And for you to have any value in life, you have to subjectively apply value to it. You determine for yourself what right or wrong is. You determine for yourself what male and female is. You determine for yourself if you want to be a human or a furry. You can determine for yourself who you are or what you're going to be because there is no objective anything. And that's the world that hasn't changed. And so if there is no purpose, then why does anybody need to die at all? Why, why even proclaim any truth? You see, the suffering of the cross overcomes nihilism because it says all suffering has a point. Because here's John the Baptist. He's a forerunner of Jesus. His suffering it fulfills not only Scripture, it just ushers in who Jesus is. And your suffering has a point. All things work for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That means that whatever you're going through, God does not waste a hurt. God does not waste the hurt of your marriage. God does not waste the hurt of your physical uh, woundedness, that he'll use that to show his power through because he can use and does use anyone at any given time. And that's why we rejoice because there is purpose for all things. And so I think that that's the part where we need to be reminding of this fact that God had a plan. Because remember, he creates people. Not because he just was bored or that he needed people. He was codependent on the human race. But because out of the unbelievable sense of love that was in the Trinity, he's like, I want to share this. But there's one problem with sharing love like that. It comes with a great risk. You give uh, an object that you have breathed life into and you give it free will, it will reject you. And it did. And so God knew at the very beginning that he'd be sending his son to the cross because he was creating something out of unbelievable love and the only way to enjoy it was for it to reject him and then him, for him to save it. 
And so he creates man. Man does exactly what he knew it would do, and it's sin, and men sin, and women sin, and for you're a sinner because you're a natural born sinner. But Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He died on that cross, rose from the dead, and anyone who will believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that is the joy of the cross. It brings us close to Jesus. And this is why we celebrate it regularly. In fact, uh, this morning, we're going to take bread, and we're going to break it. In fact, Jesus, on the night before he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, your, your, your body feeds on bread in the same way that your soul is meant to feed on Jesus. And so the question that I want you to wrestle with before you come and do this is how you respond to the suffering of the cross. Because Jesus broke himself on the cross and then, but not only that, it wasn't just a good example. It was there was a great exchange happened, a trade happened. See, Jesus' blood was shed for you. In fact, Jesus took the cup, wine, wood for wine, glass for grape juice, said, this is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. There was a great exchange. Your soul was bought at a price. Your benefit at his expense because he knew you would be as dark as you were born. Your, your sinfulness would be over all you and you couldn't escape it unless Jesus gave you his grace by shedding his blood for you. And so what we do is we remember that. But before you come up here and take communion, I want you to respond to this question. And just sit there and like, if you're a person who has given their life to Jesus, the part that I want you to think through is this question. How will I respond to suffering? And everyone has a different degrees of it. It's like, I've got this sin in my life and I would suffer not to keep to continue to do that thing. You name the thing. If you say you don't have anything, 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And most of us run around self-deceived. So maybe your prayer this morning is like, God, I'm self-deceived. I can't really think of anything. Or, or you sit here and you contemplate and you think, God, what is wrong in my life that I need to bring to you and repent and let him bring it to you? You confess it to him. God is faithful and just to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. And then you take of the bread, you take of the wine, and then you remember the goodness of God that he died on the cross for your sin. That is your hope, and that is his heart. So if you're not a Christian this morning, then you don't need to take communion. It's, it's something that Christians do because it's like a family thing. But if you believe, and maybe you believe right now, maybe the Spirit of God is working on you right now, that Jesus came, he died on the cross for you, and he rose from the dead, then you come and you take communion with us. You're part of the family. And if you're a person that's, you know, life got hard and you're just like stuck and you're like, I want to change, I just need some time to change, then you pause and you, you just take your time and don't take the Lord's Supper. But if you're like, I'm ready to repent, I'm ready to come forward, then you do and then just enjoy the fellowship of God, of the, the enjoyment of repentance. Repentance is something we need to do every day where we come to him with our brokenness and our sinfulness. We say, please, Jesus. And so here's a time for you to actively act out your faith. So I'm gonna pray for us and uh, our communion team is gonna come forward and they're gonna... Um, distribute the elements, and I'm so excited for us to just have a moment. Maybe it's just the only moment you've had all week where you're just reflecting with the Lord. Pray with me. Father, I know that you are working uh, all things out for your good and our glory, and I am grateful. And Jesus, I'm praying that this morning that somebody might, for the very first time, turn from sin and darkness and trust you, that you would take them and reveal yourself to them. And they would say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. God, I've sinned against you, my thoughts, my words, my actions. I believe you, Jesus, died on the cross for those sins, and I believe you rose from the dead. Holy Spirit, come into my life and make me the person you want me to be. And God, I'm praying that somebody that has been walking with you for a while would repent from whatever darkness they've been living in, whether it's like that just anger toward their spouse or frustration and anger towards a coworker or lust or uh, darkness or whatever the issue is where it's greed or whatever, Lord, you would work it out in them and you would do a great work for your glory and their good. Lord, we worship you. We come before you and we're reminded how beautiful the cross is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.